a major scientific discovery, a new method of producing stem cells. It's being hailed as revolutionary and could bring stem cell therapy a step closer. But is the controversy over using human embryos over? And how should ethics determine medical progress? This is Inside Story. Hello there, welcome to the program. I'm Shuli Ghosh. It's been described as a game-changing scientific breakthrough, a new way of creating stem cells that's much cheaper and faster than before. The technology could repair damaged or diseased organs and help cure, cure conditions like diabetes in future, and all without the controversy linked to the use of human embryos. Emma Haywood explains how it's done. This research carried out by scientists in Japan is being viewed as a breakthrough because it could hail a new era of personalised medicine, offering hope to sufferers of diseases such as Parkinson's, diabetes and spinal cord injuries. So how did they do it? Well, blood cells were bathed in a weak acidic solution for half an hour. The solution made the adult cells shrink and go back to their embryonic stem cell state. What makes stem cells unique is that they can become different types of cells in the body. Using this process of patients' own specially created stem cells could potentially then be re-injected back into the body to help mend damaged organs. One scientist told us this could be a major breakthrough. It enables scientists for the first time to quickly and cheaply reprogram adult cells back to a pluripotent stem cell-like state. By pluripotent, we mean these are cells that can make every single cell type of the human body. And these are vital if we're going to produce therapies in the future. The scientists in Japan used mice in this experiment, but believe the approach may also work on human cells too. If it does, it would potentially make the creation of stem cells faster and eliminate some of the ethical questions often associated with this type of science. OK, so lots to discuss. Let me introduce today's guests. They're all in London. Dusko Illich, reader in stem cell science at King's College London School of Medicine. Then we have Julian Hitchcock, a lawyer from Lawford Davis Danoon and member of the UK government's Emerging Science and Bioethics Advisory Committee. And Catherine Prescott, founding director of Biolatris Limited and former chair of the UK National Stem Cell Network. Good to have you all with us. Um, Dusko, let's start with you. Just to completely make this clear to our audience, stem cells are important because they're the building blocks of any tissue or organ. They have the potential to become cells for different tissues in the body. That's correct. And the stem I mean, that is the major advantage of the stem cells. You can use them to generate any other tissue in organism that can be used for cell therapy or for drug testing. And there are, there are embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells, but embryonic are far more versatile. That's correct. So you have different types of the stem cells. So they can be, and they're divided on pluripotency, uh, on potency. They can be pluripotent, so they can give you rise to almost any tissue in organism. They can be multipotent, so that is, their potential is somewhat limited. But uh, we are talking today more about pluripotent stem cells. And the first pluripotent stem cells that were isolated and that we talked about are embryonic stem cells. So the kind of research that they're talking about today, where adult cells are bathed in a weak form of acid and revert to their embryonic stage, that is almost the holy grail that we're looking for in this kind of research. That's absolutely correct. So this is the third, third way how you can get uh, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, researchers found that, uh, I think more by, by serendipity, it is they were thinking about uh, uh, getting clues from uh, plant science. Because, you know, if you take a branch from the tree, if you stick in the ground, sometimes it can grow roots, sometimes not. So what is influencing that? Uh, close from environment. They also looked at uh, some work from a German scientists many, many years ago uh, on salamander, and they actually said, OK, what would happen if you take mammalian cells, in this case mouse cells, and they use blood, uh, and expose to different 
enzymes, different mechanical stimuli from environment. And uh, among one of the preferable stimuli was acidity, changing acidity of the medium in which cells grow. And it is like you're putting a bit of vinegar in salad to feel better taste. So this is what they did. Okay. And exposed self, cells, yeah, for about half an hour to such concussion. And that turned them to pluripotent. So they become really, they had profound change and they become really similar to embryonic. Okay, there's and obviously there's a lot of terms here which uh, some of our audience won't, won't understand, like pluripotent. But Julian, this basically, this, What's exciting about this research is because it means that we may not have to create and then destroy embryos in order to gather stem cells. Well, of course, that fundamentally is a, is a scientific question rather than the legal one. And it was said when, um, at the time that Shinya Yamanaka announced at the end of 2008 that he'd achieved the production of these equivalent cells, these induced pluripotent stem cells, he'd achieved this with human cells. Um, immediately those who are opposed to the use of fertilized cells, uh, egg cells, as a, as a source of, of embryonic material, material immediately leapt in and said here's the ethical alternative. But it is a scientific question and in fact as, uh, as Adushka will be able to, to, to clarify there is actually a, a qualitative and a quantitative difference between the uh, an embryonic cell and an IPS cell or an induced pluripotent cell, stem cell. That's the lingo, IPS. Um, so if you, so I feel like a question of principle arises. If you were to use, if you were to say, let's not use the embryos, as they're termed, if we want to use those, we'll go ahead and we'll use the uh, Yamanaka type cell, the, the sort that, that Dushka has described, or the, the, uh, the, the new sort, that, which have just been derived using uh, acid stress. Um, if you were just to use those, how would you know that it was equivalent? You have to have the benchmark at any rate. You've got to have that. So the, yeah, so, the, so these it would new be very type easy. of cells uh, clearly have to be, uh, I mean, it, this is a very new research, so we have to see if these uh, induced stem cells are going to be as useful as um, embryonic stem cells. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, and I think that's one for Dushko. Well, let me uh, let me move on yes, to Kathy this, this. because I, I I think it's fair to say mm. that the, the controversy that has followed stem cell research um, has been about this this use of uh, of embryos, uh, causing arguments about when life begins, when an embryo becomes human. But uh, just to be clear, the, these aren't these aren't embryos which were, have been removed from a woman's body. These are uh, embryos that have been created in a laboratory. Yes, that's that's indeed correct. Um, I think the, the advantage now and the excitement that's been really arising from this brand new technique is potentially its, its simplicity and therefore the ability for lots of uh, stem cell scientists either existing or new ones who want to get into this area really gives them access to, to this new type of research and that I think is where the excitement is, is arising from. It's a very different way of looking at the science and thinking about how to take this forward. Indeed. Well, let's uh, just listen to the young Japanese researcher who made the dramatic discovery. She says she and her colleagues couldn't quite believe what they saw. When we first posted our article, one of the referees who read the article said we were mocking the history of cell biology, which has lasted for centuries because the technology was so simple. So, Kathy, she describes this as simple technology, and when you look at what they actually do did, it also sounds pretty cheap and pretty easy. Is that, is that good news for uh, eventually expanding this technique or commercialization of this technique? That's going to depend. Um, in principle, on the surface, it could be. It sounds like it's a lot more straightforward um, and indeed potentially more efficient than the existing uh, approaches which require the introduction of, of four, four genes and that in alone is quite complicated. However, you have to remember that making these cells that have the capacity to differentiate into all sorts of different cell types of the body, that's really the first step in a rather long and complex process. And so proportionally speaking, how much time and, and effort and, and money is going to be required to get to that first step 
relative to get relative to going from then the starting point, the, the cells you've now made, through to a desired cell type that you want to use, for example, for therapeutic applications or indeed for drug discovery as, as tools for, for more conventional research. So I think the jewelry's out right now, but um, it's hugely exciting, particularly from a scientific point of view. But I think from the benefits of the commercialization, I think we need to look at this in a little bit more depth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is, it is exciting. I, I think it, it really is exciting. Dusko, I mean, it, 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 um, at the moment, they've only tested this on mouse cells, but if it's shown to work on human cells, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, aren't they? True, but there is one more thing. This whole work was done on young mice, on animals that are only one week old. So we still, and such animals are more pliable for this, you would expect cells from those animals will be more pliable for changes. We don't know still whether this can happen with cells from adult animals. And of course, that should be shown first before we go to humans. And I have no doubt that similar, maybe the same, maybe a little bit different stimuli can be applied in human cells. It, it's just a matter of time that uh, we learn about how. Julian, um, this is being held as the dawn of personalised medicine. I guess when we talk about stem cell therapy, what we're looking for um, is a point where we can use our own stem cells to, uh, as a starting point to, to cure conditions or uh, to grow parts of our body or tissue that, that we need to have. Yes, I mean, I, I have to reiterate the point that this is very early early days. Absolutely, um, yes. I don't want to jump ahead uh, of it, but it, I mean, it, there's so many <laughs> um, people in this industry are, are, are hailing it as a breakthrough, as a revolution. It's hard not to get it excited. It, it is, but it's also very important, um, experience would, would, uh, would tell us, uh, not to, to hype it. Um, we've certainly had that in the past, so we have to have, be very level-headed about this indeed. It's, a, as has as been described, it's a fantastic uh, invention. It teaches some marvellous things about lion, science science of cells and sometimes it's going to be the indirect knowledge that we that we get out of this discovery which might be of value like why doesn't this happen uh, naturally what what um, systems are in place to stop this happening naturally and that might in its own right teach us ways of developing new medicines it's the sort of sideways can have a a, a a bigger impact than it seems apparent from just if you like a, a cell therapy point of view but yes you talk about personalized medicines and and so far as you can use a patient's own cell, well, yes, it has a, a lot of relevance there. In, 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 but uh, where it goes, I think I would leave others to discuss. <laughs> from a regulatory point, of, from a regulatory point of view, well, it would slot into a, an existing regulatory framework here in the U.S. or wherever. Um, uh, but uh, and I have to say that the 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 path to market, if you were to use uh, such a cell, if you were just to squeeze lemon juice on it, um, I'm afraid that that would still uh, account to a, f to a substantial manipulation and well, I mean, it would have to be regulated thing as a because, uh, uh, So itself. if it really is an acid as weak as lemon juice, I was reading one article that said, uh, you know, how come it doesn't happen when you, you, you spill lemon juice on your own skin? Well, I think that's a, a, a very important question, and in fact, in her paper, uh, Obukata actually, in, in her discussion section, she refers to this, I think, and particularly to the example of esophage oh, sorry, esophageal reflux, in other words, uh, um, the acid that might, that from, so from acid um, indigestion almost, the yes. stomach. Precisely, and the effect, and that, and it isn't found, so, so it, you might expect it to arise naturally in the esophagus. And it doesn't. So it begs a question, it's a technical question about why. And so one of the markers, one of the we call the markers, it's like a fingerprint of a cell uh, called OP4, that, that, that is apparent, that's something which, which we see in, in embryonic cells and in fact, of course, are relevant to these other cells we've talked about that, that Yamanaka uh, developed. But funnily enough, another um, very important marker doesn't appear called NANOG. Um, and so it t is telling us something about, about uh, or it's inferring some new questions as to why doesn't this normally uh, occur. And so it, it suggests an opening a door on discovering a whole new world of, of control systems. But I you know, would say from the point of view of uh, the law, the, the position remains the same. From a behind the law, the way law is driven, no doubt uh, this, will, this may help to um, open up discussions about 
the sort of determining factors that have, have tended to, to prompt um, considerations of potency. So for example in the world of, of patents um, in, in Europe uh, the position has been reached whereby uh, currently um, you can't get an, a, a patent on an invention which is derived from a quotes embryo but the but I say quotes embryo because embryo is defined as something which is capable of beginning the process of development and so there are issues there um, okay well let, let me bring in Kathy because you, in you've got some experience of, of, of patents and how the uh, industry expands uh, you know is this regenerative medicine is it within reach of uh, all patients, poor as well as rich? I mean, who foots the bill for, the, for this kind of research and how does it become available to us all? This is an enormously important question and it's one I think we're still trying to fathom, out on, uh, fathom ourselves. So we know, um, if you look at, there's a recent report that was published towards, uh, I think, the end of last year from out of the US from the Alliance for Regenta Medicine and there they point out that over a billion dollars has been poured into Regenta Medicine research, or over a billion dollars in fact. And I think something like um, a third of that has really come from the public sector and then the rest has really come from both, um, well from investors, both that are trading in the public sector as well as private. So there's an awful lot of money going into this sector which is fantastic. I would say that more is going to be required. But key to this is really can we generate affordable medicines from um, from derived from stem cells, from, from uh, as cellular therapies. They're going to be, based on our current uh, technologies that we have available, expensive to manufacture, and that's then going to bring about questions about you know, who's actually going to pay for them within our healthcare system. And if there's going to be a huge demand for them, for example, if these are really now um, the potential solution for treating chronic diseases, there should be this huge demand for them. But of course, that could potentially sort of bankrupt um, a healthcare system. So there needs to be um, a, a mechanism to improve the cost of, of making these cells, which right now is expensive, and that's lots of technology that needs to be developed there. And back to Dusko for the science in terms of how we're going to ad potentially address that, that particular question. There's lots of questions around um, how we're going to price these products who's going to be able to afford them, and indeed, how are they going to be valued? Well, These let's have a quick comment from Dusko, from um, because uh, you're obviously uh, involved in stem cell science. Uh, is, uh, is, this, is stem cell therapy uh, going to be uh, available to everybody or only those who can afford it? But the goal is to be uh, available to everybody. However, it's not so simple. It, it, it needs time to, to, ha to happen. So one, it's like, I mean, you probably know that uh, there are four blood uh, types, A, B, A, B, and zero. So practically with this one, you can cover whole population. We are talking, uh, if you have a bank of those four different types, but when we're talking about cell therapy, there is uh, some different type of molecules. They're called HLA types or human leukocyte antigens. And there are many more combinations. There are hundreds of those. And it would be ideally actually to make a bank that covers uh, the most population which, with the most uh, common HLA types. And this is just like the way how actually uh, different governments start to approach cell therapy. And currently in Japan, Japanese government puts, I don't know, more than $300 million into uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and stem cell therapy. And one of the current projects that uh, Shinya Yamanaka is working on is to build a bank of uh, about 100 uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, types that have different, different HLA types, which is supposed to cover about 70 to 80 percent of Japanese population. So practically, if you then need something, need transplant, need muscle, bone, you can go to the bank, get the right cells that match your body and go like that. When you talk about personalized, it is yours for you, 
that would be too expensive and I don't think that would ever happen. Okay, all right. I just want to uh, have a brief look at how ethics can uh, guide or influence um, medical research. Stem cell research, as we've said, is controversial because the cells are normally obtained by destroying human embryos, but that's not the only research that some find ethically questionable. Another controversy is cloning. Think Dolly the sheep. Cloning is the process of creating an exact copy of an organism. It could allow us to one day replace our old faulty organs, but some see it as tampering with Mother Nature. Genetic engineering is another field which could eradicate birth defects and hereditary conditions, but it has led to fears of designer babies and superhumans. And how about this one? Human-animal hybrid research. Some US states have already banned it, but that hasn't stopped scientists elsewhere producing pigs with human blood or rabbit eggs with human cells. And finally, several scientists have been experimenting with the bird flu virus, creating super strains which are more contagious and deadly than anything in nature. Um, Julian, uh, there's some weird research going on. Is this a problem uh, uh, that human research uh, is going into so many new and amazing areas? People are getting worried about the morals, about the ethics, and so are asking for more regulation, more laws? I th that was a fairly um, expansive list. I mean, and, and I think the bird flu issue, perhaps I put to one side, I think that's a separate and very, very important one. But referring more to, to, to the other ones in your scope, I would say that as a general matter, the, the biggest concern that I would have is education, is that people, the, the public is able to understand the issues. Now, if we take that example, the particular example of, it's, we'll stick with embryos and clones. Um, and if you like human-animal hybrids. Now in the United Kingdom there was a consultation. We have a very robust um, regulatory system here and in anticipation of some work which was proposed by a couple of researchers in this country in London and in Newcastle there was in fact uh, two consultations which were undertaken about this. The first of them which was by the from the Department of Health asked a, 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 the question do you think that it would be a good idea to have human and animal uh, hybrids? It was sort of like that, un completely unqualified. And funnily enough, a lot of people said, no, that's terrible. Because Let me guess, they, could they anticipate. said no. <laughs> yes, they said no, because it was unqualified. Now, and the papers tended to put this across as being something that would, you know, you know maybe we'd actually grow some sort of, I don't know, cow person or... <laughs> the truth is so was so far removed from that as to be laughable. When people in the second um, consultation, once people were more aware of what it actually involved and realised that it, it, it wasn't actually going to create um, man chickens or, or anything like that, and, and it was actually very modest, there was no possibility of anything developing like that at all, then uh, there were the, you, we got a more considered vote. Now, I think the view I would take personally is that uh, in a democracy people should of course be able to make you know, decisions of this sort of such import uh, require democratic buy-in, it's essential. But underlining that is an understanding of the evidence and there's a danger in um, many of these areas, um, uh, uh, common in some countries more than others, where a poor understanding of the science and the issues leads to extremely poor regulation and understanding. Uh, the United States, I have to say, is up there with the worst. Do you agree with um, that, Cathy? Uh, the Absolutely. I think Julian has hit the nail on the head, and it's exactly right. Education is the way to go forward, and it's really one of the most important issues. And it really speaks to that all the stakeholders that are engaged with this, whether it's the scientists, the clinicians, whether it indeed are the, the, the investors, both from the public side of things as well as from private, and indeed, of course, the patients and the general public. Uh, and it is a case that regulations vary from place to place, place to isn't it? Yes, yes. And I think that, um, as Julian says, I think within, certainly within the UK, um, the UK government has been very careful to make sure that, you know, they're brought up to speed, that they understand what the what the issues are and that they take a balanced perspective going forward. And I think we can only do that if, if we take people along with us. Mm. It has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us here on this uh, episode of Inside Story. My guests today, Dusko Illich, Julian Hitchcock and Cathy Prescott.
And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to join the debate, why not tweet us? Send your comments to us at AJ Inside Story. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Thanks for watching from me and all the team here. Bye for now.